by Emily McGuire. Can I say McGuire? McGuire? It's McGuire. <laughs> Emily McGuire, who's a research associate at the UK Dementia Research Institute at Cardiff University. We're probably not going to talk about the DRI enough, which we should say. The UK Dementia Research Institute is an amazing network of institutions in uh, Cardiff, UCL, King, Kings? No, Imperial? Imperial and um, Edinburgh as well. They're all over the country. They're amazing places that are funded. Alzheimer's Research UK is one of the organisations that funds those along with Alzheimer's Society and other organisations as well. And we've got quite a lot of researchers from the UK, I guess abbreviated to DRI, but it's the UK Dementia Research Institute joining us. Uh, Emily, I think you're the first from there joining us from, from Cardiff. Um, we've also got Dr. Sarah Ryan, who's an Alzheimer's Society Research Fellow at the University of Manchester. Oh, and you just, of course, missed, do you, do you know Gemma from Salford? I do, yes. <laughs> yeah. We've um, done a lot of AR UK events together, actually, in Manchester and Salford. Fantastic. And we've got Dr. James Quinn, the second of our three Quinns. <laughs> I, I picked up on this earlier, we had three people with a surname Quinn joining us today, which is, seemed remarkable to me, uh, who's a neurology research fellow at Man Massachusetts General Hospital at the Department of Neurology uh, in the USA. I'm, I'm guessing, is it half past seven, half past yeah. eight? Yeah, you made me, and it's Labor, it's Labor Day today, so it's the... Oh, it's a bank holiday as well. <laughs> holiday as well. You really uh, <laughs> treated me this morning, but uh, it's fine. So, Worth it. James is is from the UK, but you've been in the US for what, about twelve months now. Yeah, so what well, I moved out here in May two thousand and nineteen. So and you were at Manchester, so do you know Sarah? Sarah sat yeah. behind me. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, uh, James actually kicked me off of my desk when he arrived and took my desk, and I had to move opposite. <laughs> That's how closely we worked together. Sorry, Sarah. It's a, it's a small. Uh, I'll let that go well, one day. <laughs> well, and we did get him up early. So we'll, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Although he's got dressed, I see. So that's a bonus. I know. I thought I'd dress <laughs> up at least. I, I'm, I think Marianne was in a dressing gown earlier. I didn't want to say. <laughs> Marianne from, she's, she was in Sydney. Uh, no, Melbourne though. Okay. So um, neuropeptide cells. Um, we're on another science subject, which is uh, interesting. The last couple of sessions on this have been really fascinating. Emily, I'm going to come to you first and ask you to introduce yourself. Okay, well, um, so I'm Emily from Cardiff and uh, I mainly work with stem cells. So I don't assume that so we have a fundamental understanding of stem cells. Essentially, they're a cell type that can uh, you find in the body and that can differentiate or change into any other cell type in the body. Uh, so we use these to study dementia. The main way in, that I do this at the moment is, so as was talked about quite a lot today, a lot of genetics kind of studies on lots of people with Alzheimer's and without Alzheimer's uh, has meant that we've found quite a few genes or changes in the genetics of people with, that makes people more or less susceptible to developing Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And uh, one gene that I work on was found to like if you have this change in your genetics, then you're less likely to get Alzheimer's disease. So, sorry, yeah. No, so, so that, that's great. We'll, we'll come back and talk about that some more. Uh, Sarah, could you introduce yourself as well? Uh, yes, yeah, so I also work on genes that cause dementia. Uh, well, I guess it's the opposite of what you just said, genes that do cause dementia rather than genes that protect from it. Um, I work on frontotemporal dementia, or FTD for short, which um, I think we've heard a bit about this morning already, but there's going to be a focus session on it later on today as well. So uh, I won't go into too much detail you about sort of the, uh, the clinical side. Um, but I'm based in the lab, like, like these guys, uh, rather than working with people affected. So uh, I also work with cells in a dish. Um, and I'm trying to understand how a particular genetic error causes FTD. Fantastic. And James? Um, so my project is looking at neuropeptides. So these are signaling molecules in the brain and how they become dysregulated in dementia. So we're looking at them in the brains of patients with dementia, as well as the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. I don't know how much discussion we've had on CSF, but I can talk about it a little bit later. 
um, and basically trying to study them as a potential biomarker, so a way of diagnosing uh, people living with dementia and a way to kind of stratify um, different types of dementia as well as look at how uh, maybe as a potential precision medicine based approach. So I know Gemma kind of just mentioned that, but I wasn't able to tune in for too many of the presentations earlier. <laughs> oh, that's, that's fine. So you all work with cells. You all know your way around a microscope. Yeah, is that fair to say? I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oversimplifying. I'm going to come to, to back to you then, Emily, first of all. So first of all, you talked about, so you work in stem cells. Yeah. And so we've got uh, about 100 people watching now. So we've be clear. Uh, when we talk about stem cells, there was this, this thing that immediately jumps into many people's heads is, is oh, they, they come from babies, right? They're, they're, they're the thing, that's not the case any. No. So why don't you tell us, what, is it, what, how, what are stem cells and where do you get them from? Uh, so generally, now you can make stem cells from any other cell type on the body, but we have a few kind of uh, ones that we like to use because it's, it's more efficient. So the stem cells that I work on at the moment were taken from uh, just someone who's alive, their skin cells, uh, like 30 or 40 years ago. And then uh, we put some proteins on to these uh, skin cells, well, someone did 30, 40 years ago, that made them turn into stem cells. Uh, and then once we have these stem cells, we can change them into other cell types in, in the body. So they, yeah, we don't use them. Um, and where, why, why from somebody 30, 40 years ago? Does it take, does it take that long? No, it doesn't take that long. They just, so, you know, in the same way you have certain kind of types of mice that are like well established as, as models for Alzheimer's because uh, they're well characterized and they're really well understood. Yeah. It's the same with this particular line of stem cells that was taken ages ago. So, and now loads of people use this same line as a basis for, for their studies. And that means that they can all be compared very easily. So you could just use your own but you don't because you, everybody uses the same one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like a good kind of a background, right? So you know that all of the other genes are kind of similar in, the, in that cell line and that in other studies that have been done using this cell line. Uh, but you can also make more. So at the moment, we've got some uh, blood samples in from uh, some people who have Alzheimer's disease and don't have Alzheimer's disease, and we're making those into stem cells. So you can, you can make more. As we well. don't make anything, um, but this is a standard, and this is what this comes from some kind of company or something that supply yeah. these yes. things that you make in or get it from another lab. That yeah. makes sense. Honestly, I, I think I, I do feel that that is important to, to say for people out there that are understanding how you what stem cells you make them so you can you put proteins on them, they can come from anything, but you use them from a particular place, and then having created that stem cell, you can make that into anything. Yes, so what we do, uh, because you know- so in Now tell us how you use that in your work and <laughs> Yeah, so obviously in uh, Alzheimer's disease, the, a big cell type affected is like cells in the brain and specifically, uh, you know, like the immune system and immune cells in the brain. Uh, so what, what I, we do at the moment is, uh, so it's been determined if you throw like a certain combination of proteins onto the stem cells, they will change into these uh, brain immune cells called microglia. And uh, what we're doing is comparing the microglia, which have, as I said earlier, this kind of protective genetic change and ones that don't to kind of see how the protective change affects the way that your brain cells work at like a cellular level. At least that's the idea. Microglia, so Gemma referred to this earlier as this, people with Alzheimer's have a load of rubbish that builds up in the brain and it's a bit like your kitchen and sometimes it might have just not got put in the bin or a microglia are essentially the the housekeeper right they're, they're the cleaner yeah yeah that is that is definitely one of the the main things that microglia do and in, and in fact one of the uh so this this change uh that protects cells that we know from from patients one of the ways that it seems to be changing the function of the microglia is to be increasing this uh, engulfment or this taking up of the uh, kind of debris and bands. So, so if you can test and prove this works, how might that be used? Would this be something that you could activate in everybody else or something you'd put into somebody or? Well, okay, so obviously 
well, maybe not obviously, but because these studies are very early days, right? So, and it's a cellular study. So down the line, it's, it's very far off if it could be used as a therapy. But I do think that the idea sort of ultimately would be, so we know that this, um, this change increases the activity or of the uh, protein that, that, you know, we're looking at. So the idea would be maybe we could add activators of this protein and that that might have some positive effect on Alzheimer's brains. Although, as I said, it's very like basic research at the earliest of stages. So we're not, not even at the point of doing this in mice or something like that yet. It's still in mice in... At the same time. So I, I work um, with another postdoc on my lab and I do the experiments on the, these human uh, stem cells and he does the experiments on mice with the same mutation. So we work very closely together. So we're doing it in mice at the same time. So if this proves to work, then you'd you'd move this on to some very limited testing in in actual brain tissue or in people. I think the next the next stage would be to find out a bunch of molecules using like chemical modeling that we think might be able to activate or increase the activity of this protein and then to test those kind of like in batch to see what ones have uh, good effects on the, the function in a way that we think might be positive. Does that, does that make sense? So that would be the next stage. And then if something seemed really promising, then maybe you would move that to uh, other animal models or to clinical trials. But I do think that that's quite... So we're talking, it's quite far down the line for now, yeah. but that kind of under kind of underpins that there's no quick fix to this, that this is gonna be, and also kind of highlights the importance of the whole chain of events. Like, like later on today, when we talk about a blood test for diagnosis, if it turns out the people you need to test this in are people at a very early stage preclinical, you can't do that if you can't find who those people are, but you can if you've got a blood test that identifies people who have a bigger risk in their thirties, if that's when you want, yeah. Sarah, can I come to you next? So can we tell us, do you, tell us about your work? Okay, so I'm interested in a particular type of FTD from temporal dementia that is caused by a genetic error. So um, there's a faulty gene, and we know that people who have this faulty gene uh, get FTD. So it can be passed down in families, or it can sort of occur spontaneously. Um, and my job is to try and figure out why does having this faulty gene cause brain cells to stop working properly, eventually to, to die prematurely, and that's what ultimately leads to the symptoms of FTD. So why does having this gene uh, lead to the disease, basically? Um, I've been working on looking at a series of proteins that get made from this faulty gene um, and trying to figure out how they're involved in disease. So if you think of genes as being kind of like the instruction manual for um, uh, flat pack furniture, like Ikea furniture. But instead of building a wardrobe, you're building a protein. So your cells reading your genes and it's using that as instructions to build particular proteins. And in the same way that from Ikea, you can get a bedside table or a wardrobe or a, uh, a chair, um, you, your genes are instructions for lots of different proteins that are different shapes and sizes. And the shape is really important for how that protein functions. So if the instructions are wrong, and the cell makes a protein that's the wrong shape, that could mean that the protein isn't able to do its job. And that could have really disastrous consequences for uh, the cell and how the cell functions and stop it from working properly. Uh, the gene that I work on is actually a little bit unusual because instead of having a little section of the instructions that's garbled and making the protein sort of incorrectly, what you actually have is a huge extra section in the instructions that's not supposed to be there. So you have this huge extra section of DNA in that gene and it's making protein, but it's not supposed to. So you actually have five completely abnormal proteins being produced in the brains of people with FTD that aren't normally supposed to be there in healthy people. And we know that these proteins clump together, they, they stick together and form clumps inside brain cells, a bit like what Gemma was talking about before with um, sort of junk building up in, in the brain cells. And if we look down a microscope at the brain of someone who lives with FTD of this type and donated their brain to science after they passed away, we can actually see the protein forming these clumps inside the brain cells. So we know they're there, we know they're probably not good for the cells, but we don't know exactly how or why they're getting in the way of things. And that's what I'm trying to work out. So D 
do you then look at why they're produced in the first place or or just or do you move would somebody else look at how you might get rid of them for example as opposed to or you do to avoid them trying to ever be made Yes, so there is a lot of work. That's not what I do personally, but there is a lot of work going on in parallel um, around the UK into ways to stop the gene producing protein in the first place, which would be fantastic because that would be a, a, a really promising therapeutic option. But I think it's still important in the meantime that we're trying to understand the effects that these proteins are having in the cells. In case that doesn't work, we need to be able to design other, other therapeutics as well. Um, so that's where I come in. So I use cells in a dish and what I do is I treat them with artificial DNA that I've made in the lab that kind of copies what you get in the faulty gene that people have, people with SED. And I can trick myself into thinking that that's their own gene and making protein from the artificial DNA that I'm giving them. So the cells actually start to make the dementia proteins, um, they're pumping them out and I can look down the microscope at my own cells and see that like uh, what we see down the microscope if we look at the brains of people with FTD, uh, my cells are also producing the protein. It's also clumping together um, and you can see that very clearly. So we know that we've got a, a good sort of model system that mimics what's going on inside actual people's brains. And then I can then look in those cells and see, well, what other processes are affected? What other proteins uh, are these abnormal proteins interacting with? How are they getting in the way? And the idea is if we understand that at that level of detail of individual proteins and molecules and, and cells, that we can try and design really specific targeted treatments to intervene in those disease processes and stop them from happening. I think that makes sense to and even the, you know, people who really don't get science so well is, is being able to reproduce that what's going on in the brain to start with is the most important thing because of course you can't, you can't, you can't study in exactly the same way as when people are living right i mean you can't go exactly <laughs> and not not today james can we come to you next is, is this relate to to your work as well yeah a little bit um i'm very predominantly kind of looking um using the the data that we're pulling out from the cerebral spinal fluid as well as the data that we're looking at from brain tissue where we've shown that these neuropeptides, these are signaling molecules. So I'm sure many of you watching will know about neurotransmitters. So these are your serotonin, your dopamine, et cetera. Um, neuropeptides are very similar. Um, they act as signaling molecules. They are important in um, kind of the function and sending messages across uh, throughout the brain. And all of this is like super important, but they come really dysregulated in uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So dementia, as well as psychiatric diseases as well. So we have um, some really interesting data looking in uh, brain tissue and cerebral spinal fluid to show that these neuropeptides are severely dysregulated and they are a really good marker of cognitive decline. Um, so we've got some yeah, good data on that. And essentially I'm trying to push this as a potential biomarker as a, a, a potential way of kind of diagnosing people as early as possible. And also as a way of, as a marker of cognitive decline. I think that's the most important thing. Um, that we really need to get because I mean we have the tau test we have the the amyloid tests which are really good for saying yes that person's got dementia we don't have too many good correlates of actual damage that's happening in the brain we have neurofilament light but it's an extremely messy um, protein for diagnosis because it's upregulated in any disease it's upregulated in covid for example so you can get so many kind of confounding factors so we've got some really interesting data on the neuropeptides. So I'm really trying to study them in better detail um, as a potential biomarker. So I'm doing lots of kind of experiments in the lab. So I'm producing the DNA in the lab, uh, producing the protein in the lab. Um, I'm doing functional studies, expressing them in cells, trying to work out why they're becoming dysregulated. So I'm really uh, trying to unpick the mechanistic understanding and understand why these are becoming dysregulated. And right at the start, you mentioned CFS, so this is cerebral spinal, spinal fluid, because and you collect that from the spine because that's the same fluid that floats around in the brain. Yeah, so it's the same fluid that floats around through the brain, so the proteins can transfer from the, the brain into the cerebral spinal fluid, so we can get a really good understanding of what's happening in, in the brain. You can also look in the blood, but the, uh, the concentration in the, in the blood is significantly lower 
uh, than in the cerebrospinal fluid. Mm -hmm. So there have been some developments recently to look at tau and amyloid in, in the blood, but the neuropeptides are just at extremely low level in the blood. So we'd have to look at developing ultra sensitive ways of uh, detecting them. And we have a, in, in my group, so we're the Alzheimer's clinical and translational research unit. So we have a full clinical arm of the lab. So we're doing cerebrospinal fluid tests, regularly MRI scans. So this makes it a really good place to, to do the research that we're trying to do because we have access to all of the, uh, the clinical uh, diagnosis as well as all of the information we can get about the patient. Because that's the most important thing. If we want to develop a precision medicine based approach is that we understand the person fully. We have the cognitive assessments, we have the MRI scans, we have the EEG recordings, we have the blood tests, we have the cerebrospinal fluid tests because we're not going to understand this disease looking at one thing. We need to look holistically. And this is what the Dementia Research Institute is trying to do. This is what we're trying to do here in the US and is what needs to be done uh, in order yeah, to find treatment and cure. Great to have a place where all that is combined into the same place. And I can't help but I think anybody who's watching this would look and say, you know, all three of you are working on very different things, but in that kind of, in that space. And could you all be right and still all be connected or is this is this just different is this just different approaches to look at to the look at this i mean or, or could you all be right and then the treatment will fall out of the back of all three of your work all, all angles need to be investigated uh with dementia because it's such a complex disease so all of the scientists all of their contribution is vital i think if we're going to find a cure for it and um, some of us will be wrong in uh, the avenues that we choose to pursue. But at the end of the day, you don't know what's right and what's wrong before you start. So all, all of the avenues are essential to find a cure. Is, is exactly. Right. And you've made exactly the point that I was hoping to make exactly, is the importance of that, <laughs> that you can't close off any one line of thought that you have to continue. So, you know, Sarah's approach to looking at this in, 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 in there and James's and yours is, is all slightly different, but it's all fundamentally contributing to that body of learning. And do you all, I mean, as scientists, you don't develop too much tunnel, tunnel vision, end up in your own space. Do you all continue to look at each other's, to, to look at the work and that research that's been published? Is that why publishing is so important? Yeah, I think that's really important because often you could go to, say I go to a conference and it's a general, uh, dementia conference or neurodegeneration conference and I work on just FTD so in the lab maybe my blinkers are kind of on because that's what I focus on but going and hearing what's going on in the world of Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia that might give me a really good idea of oh well maybe that actually could work in a similar way in in what I study and can I maybe apply that um, and, and like Emily was talking earlier on about the role of microglia and the immune system in Alzheimer's disease, I think that's probably really important in STD as well. So I'm looking at that. So, you know, we have a lot of links between us that I think are very important. And, and that's where I think like Alzheimer's Research UK, who have their research, their local networks as well, do facilitate that kind of cross pollination of ideas and learning from each other as well through bringing particularly early career research or early career researchers and bringing early career researchers together to to come up with those ideas and and funding not just one thing but a whole range of research we've got some questions and we've got three minutes left uh so the first question is from g martin cooper who asks he doesn't put this to any one person so let's see um, how does the function of microglia reconcile with the concept of tau protein tangles uh, well, I mean, I'm happy to... Go on, Emily, you take that one. Well, um, so it's quite early days, right? We don't fully understand the link between microglia and tau, but a lot of groups are working on it at the moment. Uh, one way it could be affecting it is because, as, as it's been talked about previously, microglia take up uh, kind of debris and things in the brain. And uh, it's been suggested that microglia could stop or help stop the, the spread of tau by taking up the tangles and breaking them down. Uh, but at the same time, tau can activate microglia or make them like more energetic. And uh, in, in a way, this can be damaging to the brain. So, so there's, there's lots of uh, potential intersection there between tau and microglia, but we don't fully understand it at the moment. Fantastic. 
Thank you, Emily. I mm -hmm. hope that's answered your question, Martin. Um, we've got a question to, this is to you, James, from uh, Rachel M, who asks, how can we make CS, CFS tests that can be carried out without uh, spinal taps? For surely this needs to be done if we're going to use it as a regular diagnostic test. Mm, a nicer way to collect that CFS, CSF. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that's possible, unfortunately, but from what we've done in, in, in our lab, we've done lots of studies on CSF and I know there's work in UCL with some of the, the genetic trials for Huntington's disease, for example, where they're taking CSF regularly between every two and four weeks and they found no issues associated with that. So I just want to come here and say that a CSF test is very much perceived as being invasive. Um, I've said that I'm more than happy to go get a CSF test done. Um, and it's very much like it is not as bad as people think it's going to be. Um, and my boss does them extremely regularly and he has, they have really good kind of a rate of people coming out with this very, very minimal, minimal issues. And the majority of issues is generally just a headache or a little bit of pain associated where the needle went which is what you'd get from getting a blood test done. But that's that's the point. It's like we really want to be developing this into a blood test. CSF is great because you get such a good understanding of what's happening in the brain, but then translate it into a blood test. And, and there's better, and, you know, other techniques as well, aren't they? But I, but I agree. I think clearly there could be more done to um, not just about CSF, but about all the different diagnostics that are used to communicate what it is you're gathering and to kind of, improve public awareness and understanding of of what it's like to to go through that diagnostic process whether that's csf or not um I, I, yeah clearly that's something that needs to get better uh, our next guests have joined us thank you ever so much i your work is all really fascinating and i do feel i sorry i know you didn't have slides i feel like i could have had slides from you and that would have but um all uh, three, James, Sarah and Emily, have all uh, contributed to podcasts on dementia research before and blogs as well. So you can find out more about their work on the website, which is chatterbond.uk. You can also find details of their Twitter names there as well. And I know they all tweet about their work and their publications and things. So please do go and look them up uh, and have a look on the website as well. Thank you, Emily, Sarah, James, for joining us. Thank you. Um, uh, enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, James. I'll let you go back to bed or do whatever you're going to do on your, on your holiday.